Good evening. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. This is Craig Trulia, and with me tonight is Dr. Lukatis. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. How are we doing this evening? Lukatis. Lukatis. I don't speak right. Greek, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's We had some interesting technical issues, but I'm happy that you kind of hung through it, and uh, we are doing this right now, and we're discussing a very interesting topic, um, the Ecumenical Council of Nicaea II, and whether or not the issue of papal supremacy is endorsed or not by this council. But before we jump into that, I would like uh, people that are listening, this is mostly an Orthodox audience, though we do have Roman Catholic listeners. I would like those who are uh, listening to know who you are, what you're about, what you've published. And so if you don't mind, uh, give us a little bit of that information. Well, I published four books on Eastern Orthodoxy, and um, they're basically all in support of papal primacy and infallibility. When I was a student at the University of Buffalo many years ago, I studied the history of the schism between East and West and examined the papal letters of the popes of the first millennium. And it's quite obvious to me that they not only affirmed papal supremacy over the entire church, their universal authority over the entire church, but also they stress the indefectibility of the See of Peter from all heresy. And I think that's confirmed right in the letter that uh, the letters that um, Pope Hadrian the first sent to the emperor and to the Council of Nicaea where he says, the Lord set him who bears the keys of the kingdom of heaven as chief over all, and by him is he honored with this privilege, by which the keys of the kingdom of heaven are entrusted to him. He therefore that was preferred with so exalted an honor, was thought worthy to confess the faith on which the church of Christ is founded. A blessed reward followed that blessed confession by the preaching of which the Holy Universal Church was illumined, and from it the other churches of God have derived the proofs of faith. For the blessed Peter himself, the chief of the apostles, who first sat in the apostolic sea, left the chiefship of his apostolate and pastoral care to his successors, who are to sit in his most holy seat forever. And that power of authority, which he received from the Lord God, our Savior, he too bestowed and delivered by divine command to the pontiffs, his successors. Now, if words mean anything, here you have an affirmation of the special privileged authority that the Roman pontiff possessed in the church, precisely because he was a successor of Peter to whom the keys of the kingdom were given. And of course, the keys of the kingdom are the symbol of supreme authority in the church. And that is, is the basic difference, isn't it, between Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy? Namely, where Peter is, there is the church. And where Peter is not, there is not the church as Christ established. So it seems to me that Pope Hadrian is simply following in the simply following his predecessors, all the way from Damasus in the 4th century to to Nicholas I in the 9th century. They're all basically saying the same thing. The Roman pontiff has a supreme authority in the church because he is a successor of Peter, who was made by Christ, the rock of the church, the confirmer of his brethren, he, he who was told to strengthen his brethren in the faith and was made the chief pastor of all the lambs and sheep of Christ. So the authority of the Roman pontiff is based upon Christ commissioning Peter as the rock, the confirmer of the brethren, the chief pastor of the church, and who holds the keys of the kingdom, namely supreme authority in the church. 
the basic question has always seemed to me over the years is, is there a supreme authority in the church? If there is, it can only be the Roman pontiff as successor of Peter. If there is no supreme authority in the church, then all is administrative and juris jurisdictional chaos, which is what we see in, sadly to say, in modern Eastern Orthodoxy. <clears throat> All right. That's the opening. That's your opening. And so what I'm going to do is give my opening. It's going to get a lot into the content of the letters. And then when I'm done, we could go back and forth. You could critique and we'll take it from there. So without further ado, I will start. And I want to say this. When it comes to ecclesiology, Nicaea II is in many ways a remarkable council. It asserts that, the, that Pope Honorius was anathematized as a heretic because he taught, ex cathedra perhaps, there was but one will in operation. That's a quote from Nicaea II. It also asserted the whole church is undespoiled, unshaken, uh, immovable. In other words, infallible and defectible. And applied Matthew 16, 18, likewise to the whole church. It gave a definition of what constitutes an ecumenical council, and it is not the ratification of the Pope, but his cooperation is, a necess is necessary alongside the assent and common vote, exact words from the council, of the entire church. It also teaches against iconoclasm and universalism, universalism by the way, which is what most people are concerned about in Nicaea too. However, however, there's one unremarkable passage from the council, which Roman Catholic apologists claim proves papal supremacy. It is that of Pope Adrian's letter to the emperors. Pope Adrian asserts the following as the basis as to why Romans' veneration of icons should be accepted by the whole church. Here's what was read out at the council. And for those following along, they could click on the link in the description. And also, um, this is in the Greek minutes. It says this. And let your divinely received power give all honor to the most holy Roman church of these chief apostles, Peter and Paul, to whom power has been granted by God the word himself to lose and to bind sins in heaven and on earth, for they will become the guardians of your kingdom and will subdue all the barbarian nations under your feet, and wherever ye go, they will make you victorious. Now these same holy and chief apostles who laid the foundation of the Catholic and Orthodox faith have left their written law, that all, that all who ever should succeed to their thrones should maintain the same faith and should continue in it even unto the end. And thus it is that our church maintains and honors holy images. And even then, from the beginning to this day, our churches have been adorned and beautified with venerable images. As the most holy and blessed Pope Sylvester bears witness, when in the beginning of our Christian orthodoxy, Constantine of pious memory, who then ruled, was converted to the faith. The record is as follows. The day had now passed away, and night having succeeded, he gave orders that silence be observed, and while he was sleeping, behold, the holy apostles Peter and Paul stood by him, who thus spake, send and call for Sylvester, Bishop of Rome. What I read is literally the whole section everyone debates over, in its completion, other than me shortening the what Saints Peter and Paul said. Right, so once it goes up to holy apostles, Peter and Paul stood by him who thus spake, then I just went right to the Pope about, part about Pope Sylvester. Now, the Roman church has a special charism and is received from the apostles Peter and Paul to bind and lose sins. This charism belongs to all who succeed to their thrones, not just Rome. All right, those obedient to the apostles maintain their faith, and so Rome maintains her icons. This is precisely what the passage is saying. And as proof of the proceeding, Pope Adrian cites the history of an earlier pope, Sylvester, and recounts an episode where those same apostles appeared to Constantine for him to seek recourse from that same Sylvester. And if we keep reading the story, we find there are icons used even in that day, which is why Pope Adrian quotes the story. So what an uncontroversial, unexciting passage this is. It is no wonder that the whole council accepted this letter after Tiresias insisted upon its authenticity to be verified. Keep that in the back of your mind. So why does this uncontroversial passage stir up controversy today? 
Well, mainly it's because uninformed Roman Catholic apologists do not read the Greek rendering of Adrian's letter, but instead insist upon the Latin rendering of the minutes of Nicaea II in this section. And this is most baffling because the whole, the sole source for the Latin rendering is from Anastasius the Librarian. And Anastasius was emphatic that the Greek version of the letter was what was actually read in the council. A century later, a Vatican gloss on, on, uh, on one of Pope Nicholas's letters that talked about these differences between the Greek and Latin also agreed with this assessment. So I'm citing Roman Catholic sources. Into the present day, the majority of scholars and translators of this passage, including Roman Catholics, Anglicans, and Orthodox, and who have treated this passage are likewise in agreement. So a contrarian view in favor of the Latin minutes at this section was recently expounded by Dr. Eric Lambers and has been endorsed by Father Richard Price, but in their footnotes, if anyone bothers reading them, it's revealed that they are outnumbered by people who disagree with them on that point. And so my debate opponent, I believe, has an uphill battle in order to establish that Nicaea II somehow teaches papal supremacy. He has to either prove that the Greek rendering as accepted by the majority of people throughout history uh, somewhere teaches papal supremacy real far in between the lines, or he has to argue in favor of the reliability of the Latin minutes. Now remember, the Orthodox side does not need to prove that the Latin was forged, though this is possible. The Latin can be authentic and original to Pope Adrian. However, what the council accepted, according to both Roman Catholics and Orthodox, since the ninth century until the 1990s, was a consensus opinion that the Greek and not the Latin rendering was what was read. From Anastasius to Macaron, an eminent Nicaea II scholar, the idea that variations in the Latin and Greek originate in diplomatic alterations during the council should be uncontroversial. Many centuries before, even Pope Hormistas himself explicitly said in writing he allowed his legates to alter his letter. So altering letters during a council is hardly anything new. So presuming upon the majority view, that the Greek is what the council accepted, but the Latin is what Adrian himself or originally wrote, what are we to make of this? In short, I could quote the Caroline books, a source contemporary with Nicaea II, that repeatedly reject both the council and Adrian's teaching on icons. They name him by name, and they accuse his ex-cathedra teachings on icons of ex exorable error, but yet they have even more flowery, exaggerated language concerning the papacy than the Latin mints in Nicaea too. So just like earlier Latin writers such as Pope Leo used pretentious language to assert that the Roman emperor was, to quote Pope Leo, incapable of doctrinal error and inspired by the Holy Spirit, Charlemagne, as he's called in the Carol Carolingian books, used high exaggeration when he talked about the papacy. He said, this is quoting Charlemagne, the Roman see is eminent over the other apostolic sees, and this exaltation arises from no synodical action of the other churches, but he holds the primacy by the authority of the Lord himself. Now, clearly, he cannot mean the proceeding to mean that the Pope is always right or that the Carolingians must submit to the Pope, because clearly the very book that is that this is quoted from rejected the Pope's teaching and the ecumenical council he approved of. So this demonstrates that those who wrote empty honorifics in the Latin world and these, and these panegyric statements about popes understood such statements as effectively meaningless. Charlemagne's actions and words consistent with those actions speak much louder than some empty praise. So I anticipate that my opponent will assert that we must take empty honorifics about the papacy literally and inconsistently, may I add, take figuratively all the words and actions which clearly demonstrate the orthodox view of the papacy. You will ask why the popes, or perhaps Charlemagne for that matter, would use such language unless they really meant it. In Charlemagne's case, he was probably being ironic, but as for the popes, the answer is simple. Does the Bishop of Rome have a special charism from God by virtue of the relics of Peter and Paul being in Rome? Of course. Did this create precedent where Rome was the final recourse in church disputes below an ecumenical council? Absolutely. So why wouldn't Rome in diplomatic exchanges play up their charism, exaggerating it to the max, in the hope of getting maximum concessions? In Nicaea's two case, the return of jurisdiction in the Balkans that was unjustly taken from them decades before. 
No one goes into a negotiation and gives the price they're actually willing to sell. You always pretend you're going to sell for a lot more. I can actually quote Pope Hormistas doing exactly this centuries beforehand. So it's not merely an inference of mine. What is in fact an inference is that all of these popes asserting themselves as they did meant literally a lot of the things they wrote, hoping the pen would be mightier than the sword. If only I wrote something convincing and grand enough, many a pope probably thought, maybe I'll get half of what I'm asking for. And in Nicaea II's case, the pen disappointed Pope Adrian as both the Greek minutes show, being that they scotched over what he said and they and it says what about Saints Peter and Paul, not just Peter. And the fact that jurisdiction, the Balkans, was never returned. So something Rome would never have to ask for, by the way, if the church really believed they had universal jurisdiction to begin with, right? Why ask for something you already have jurisdiction over? So in closing, Nicaea II nowhere, nowhere teaches papal supremacy. The Greek minutes lack any mention of the idea and shows the Greek church never accepted it. Instead, the council itself emphatically applies to the whole church infallibility and defectibility, not to the Pope, but to the whole church. The criteria for an ecumenical council requires the assent of the whole church, not merely the ratification of the Pope. Lastly, any recourse to the Latin, even against all odds that it was ever, ever read and received by the council, is ultimately self-eviscerating because contemporary Latin thinkers do not understand papal honorifics as having any actual application in reality. Any more than the Patriarch Alexandria's story titled of being judge of the universe would have meant he literally was judge over all of creation. So that is the end of my opening statement. And I'm sure you have a lot of uh, issues um, with what I just said. So let me give the floor to you to respond and um and then we'll go back and forth okay so the microphone's let yours say, yeah let me say first <clears throat> honorius did not give any ex cathedra pronouncement because he defined nothing and you have to understand his condemnation by the Greeks at the, at the, at the ecumenical council was later modified by Pope Leo II, who said that Honorius was to be censured because he neglected to teach clearly on the question of the, of the, of the, uh, operations of Christ. So <clears throat> Honorius, was not guilty of heresy. He committed no formal heresy. He made no ex cathedra decision, but he was censured because of his negligence, which is something that can happen to any bishop, archbishop or patriarch or pope. Uh, sec secondly, I would say that um, Certainly, the Roman Church prided itself as being founded by two apostles, namely Peter and Paul. As Tertullian said, oh, how happy is the Roman Church, which suffered the blood of two apostles in its founding. But Paul was not made the rock of the church by Christ. He was not made the holder of the keys of the kingdom. He was not given the task to confirm his brethren. And he was not given the task of being the chief shepherd of the church after Christ. And so it is quite false to say that the two of them were equal. Paul himself was subordinate to Peter in the special privileges that Peter had, especially from Christ himself. In Hadrian's letter, you notice he refers to the power of authority, which he had received from the Lord God, our Savior. He too bestowed and delivered by divine command to the Roman pontiffs, his successors. Now that is a power of authority, a real authority, one of real power. And typical of the fact that he had been made the visible head of the church. In Eastern Orthodoxy, there is no head of the church. And yet throughout the first millennium, you have saints always referring to the Pope as the head of the church. And yet if you read Eastern Orthodox polemics over the centuries, 
They're horrified by the whole concept that a man could be the head of the church. But, but that is exactly what the saints called it, the Roman Pontiff, because he was the visible head of the church with special privileges in Peter to rule and govern the entire church and to be the last recourse where there is problems confronting bishops and archbishops and metropolitans in the church. <clears throat> Pope Hadrian said nothing new that was not said by great Orthodox popes like Leo the Great, Hormistus, Hadrian the First, Hadrian the Second, Agatho, and uh, Nicholas. They all basically said the same thing regarding their position in the church. Namely, they held a supremacy in and over the entire church, east and west. And it was a supremacy not grounded in canons of councils, but rather grounded in Holy Scripture itself. The famous Petrine text, giving the words of Christ, Matthew 16, 18, 19, Luke 22, 31 to 33, John 21, 15 to 17, regarding Peter's perduring and perpetual role in the church as its rock, holder of the keys, symbol of supreme authority, confirmer of his brethren, and chief pastor of the entire church, East and West. That was the specific claims, claim of the popes long before Hadrian and continued by such great Greek saints as Maximus, the confessor, who wrote, he speaks in vain, who thinks he ought to persuade or entrap persons like myself and does not satisfy and implore the blessed Pope of the Most Holy Catholic Church of the Romans. That is, the Apostolic See, which is from the incarnate Son of God himself, and also all the Holy Synods, according to the Holy Canons and definitions, has received universal and supreme dominion, authority, and power of binding and loosing over all the Holy Churches of God throughout the whole world. Now that's an astounding claim. And it's the same claim by all his predecessors in, from Damasus in the fourth century to Nicholas in the ninth. The claim is the same. And I don't see how that can be watered down or diminished in any sense because words have meaning. And when they call the Roman pontiff chief of the apostle, of, of the of the uh, chief of the the apostolic succession, and called his see the apostolic see because all the other sees founded by the apostles had lapsed into heresy, Arian heresy, Nestorian heresy, the Monophysite heresy, the Monothelite heresy, and the Iconoclast heresy. There was only one see which was indefectible in the faith. And that was the Roman church because it was possessing the privileges of Peter. So the very language that is used by all these popes affirm and reaffirm papal supremacy of authority. It's not just a primacy of honor, though they had that too. But it was primarily one of authority which is seriously lacking among the Orthodox today. The true church must be a visible body, and a visible body must have a visible head. Eastern Orthodoxy lacks that visible head necessary for identifying the true church from all the non-Catholic churches and sects that claim to be the embodiment of Christianity. The fundamental question which troubled me when I was an Orthodox, and which should trouble all Orthodox today when they see the schism between Moscow and Constantinople, and also the schism between Moscow and Alexandria also, which represents Orthodoxy? Who are the Orthodox in this formal schism that has occurred? But that is the fundamental problem that Eastern Orthodoxy has not been able to answer. Where is the true church 
when bishops and patriarchs disagree concerning the faith. Is there no ultimate authority that can resolve such questions? The Orthodox claim that all bishops are equal. But if all bishops are equal, there is no authority in the church to, to, that can finally resolve any question. And in all the dogmatic questions that exist still today between Catholics and Orthodox, there is no resolution of these questions by the Orthodox themselves. Or about the filioque? Is that still a dogmatic division between the churches? Some Orthodox churches now say no. The one fundamental difference is, of course, the papacy, and that is true. That is absolutely fundamental to the whole question, where is the true church? And the answer of all the first millennium of the church's history is where there is Peter and his successor, there is the church. So Catholics have a fundamental criterion of orthodoxy to decide such questions whereas the Orthodox have none. The concept of the church among Eastern Orthodox theologians were all divided among themselves as to the question of primacy, though you do have Constantinople claiming a kind of papal jurisdiction over the whole Church of Byzantium today. And in the Middle Ages, you have the most prominent theologians of the Byzantines basically admitting that the Pope did have and did exercise a universal authority in the church, but that he had lost that power because of the heresy of the filioque. Now that heresy of the filioque seems to have disappeared from some Orthodox today. So again, I pose the question to my Orthodox friends, where there is no supreme authority in the church, how can you resolve any dogmatic question? And how can you even determine what is an ecumenical council? Is it the number of bishops who attend it? That's not a sufficient criterion. You must have someone with authority who can decide what bishops will attend, who, who has the right to convoke that council, not the emperor. That is one of the basic problems in Eastern Orthodoxy over the centuries, namely the constant interference and aggression of emperors in the interfering in the affairs, the internal affairs of the church, daring to call an ecumenical council without the authority of the Pope. When you have many authorities among the saints who said, nothing can be decided in the church without the consent of the Roman pontiff. That in itself is a kind of admission of a power of authority possessed by the Roman pontiff, not possessed by any other bishop, archbishop, or patriarch in the church. And there are many testimonies concerning that authority from Hadrian's predecessors, which can be easily admitted and given, such as that of Galatius of the um, 5th century, where he said, the Roman see ratifies each council by its authority and safeguards it by its ceaseless oversight in virtue of its leadership authority which the blessed apostle peter received from the word of the lord and which by common agreement of the church he has always possessed and still retains and remember what the papal legates said at the ecumenical council of chalcedon in 451 let the dissenter give an account of his own judgment, for he usurped the powers of a judge when he did not possess it. He dared to hold a council without the apostolic see, which has never yet been done, nor may lawfully be done. And that can be repeated by such patriarchs of Constantinople as Nicephorus in the... Um, 8th century. So at any rate, all these popes claimed something which would be regarded as absolutely intolerable, as a manifestation of Antichrist. And that was reflected when Pope John 
uh, when Pope uh, <clears throat> John Paul II went to Athens and was greeted by mobs of people shouting Antichrist and accusing him of all kinds of heresies and so forth. But that kind of language absolutely contradicts the language of honor and respect and obedience that was played, paid to the Roman pontiff in the first millennium of the church by saints and popes and confessors. All right. So I want to focus this discussion on Nicaea too. And here's why. You brought up many good points. God willing, we could have future conversations and we could go over the details whether or not these things these points you bring up prove your overall assertion that the Roman Catholic Church is the universal church and not the Orthodox Church. However, my opinion is, humbly speaking, is that each and one of those things that you're asserting are misconstrued. And how do we evaluate whether or not those are misconstrued if we don't evaluate the issue of Nicaea II and whether it's being misconstrued by Roman Catholics? So. I'm going to wager you this. If the Roman Catholic side is wrong about papal supremacy in Nicaea II, then Roman Catholics have to keep an open mind that they're wrong about all these other supposed and alleged proofs also prove it. And so I'm going to focus on the parts of your reply specific to Nicaea II and table the discussion of other matters outside of that topic because they would not be proper for this debate. And it's possible if Nicaea II is misapprehended that each and every one of those could be misapprehended as well. So that being said, you made the point, if words mean anything in the rendering of the Latin uh, letter from Pope Adrian, at least as repeated to us by uh, Anastasius the librarian who's preserved it for us, then what Nicaea II is affirming through Agatho's letter would be, or not Agatho, but Adrian's letter would be papal supremacy. Now, there's two major issues with this. Well, the first would be that the council did not accept the Latin letter. The council accepted what we have in the Greek. So to say that the council, for example, to, uh, to quote you, um, that all these popes claim something that is absolutely intolerable. And he said, well, they didn't feel like that in the first millennium. Well, it sounds like they did find it intolerable if they heard what was said in the Latin letter and had it translated in such a sense in which it was agreeable. The translation I read in the beginning, the Greek rendering of the minutes, which may I add, the fact that the Greek actually corresponds with the whole life of, of St. Constantine with the episode of St. Sylvester, to me implies that the original passage really was the Greek rendering and it might have been fudged a little bit in the Latin, but even if it wasn't, it's kind of irrelevant. The Greek minutes is what was accepted in the council. The council's conducted in Greek and the majority of scholarship, majority of Roman Catholic thinkers agree with me on this, including those closest most to the time in which that letter was read. Now, I want to make one other point because I feel this discussion is ultimately going to hinge on whether the Latin or Greek is authentic or at least reliable, is you said, well, Pope Adrian merely reiterated what uh, Pope St. Agatho did and Pope St. Galatius, and I'm going to take issue with this, and that's going to be this, which would be in the extended Latin ending to the letter of the emperors in Nicaea II from Pope Adrian, he speaks of how, as you pointed out very well and succinctly, that the papacy gets its power from uh, the from Christ himself who gives St. Peter the keys and they as successors of Peter. Now, I will quote the section, just gets to make it a little clear, and then I'll give the microphone back to you and maybe we'll do a little more back and forth and keep the responses shorter. Um, Pope Adrian says, he quotes Matthew 16, 16, 18, you are Peter on this rock, you shall build my church, and I shall give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now Pope Adrian says, his see, which exercises primacy throughout the world, was set up as the head of all the churches of God and has always held and retains a primacy with the blessed Peter, the apostle, exercises through an injunction of the Lord's 
and with the church no less assenting to the effect that no see in the whole church ought to have a greater executive role than the first, which confirms each synod by its authority and protects it by its continuing guidance. Now that's Pope Adrian in the Latin rendering in Nicaea 2. Now I'm going to read the letter that he is quoting from or paraphrasing from Pope St. Galatius, who says the following. No true Christian should be ignorant of the rule of each synod, one approved by the assent of the whole church to the effect that no see ought to have a great executor, greater executive rule um, before others in the first, which confirms each synod by its power and protects it by its continuing guidance in the course of its primacy, which enjoined by a saying of the Lord and with the church no less assenting, the blessed Peter the Apostle um, has always and held and retains. Now, why is this important? People may have to rewind to get the difference, but I'm going to sum it up for the listener. Adrian twists the words so that way this comes by virtue simply from God and then the church assents to it. While what Pope St. Galatia says that this is the canonical rule approved by the assent of the whole church. I'm going to quote again, approved by the assent of the whole church. And so the Pope gets his prerogatives, according to Adrian, from God solely, but according to Pope St. Galatius, the actual saint of the two, from the church, from conciliar approval of the church, from canonical norms. And so I would actually take issue that Adrian merely said what Agatho said, at least according to these Latin minutes, he clearly did not. It actually is inconsistent with what previous popes said, um, with what Galatius said and what Pope St. Agatho said in his letter. Um, but I'm going to table it there um, after one last comment, which was you said that the emperor um, can't call a council and Evangelos Christos, who's a scholar on this topic, um, said it was unprecedented to assert that the pope calls a council and not an emperor. In fact, all the ecumenical councils were called by emperors. We could take a moral issue with some of their tactics and that would be a great other episode. But what's not up for dispute is that ecumenical councils were called by emperors and were assented to by the Pentarchy and cooperated with by the papacy. That is the definition given the succession of Nicaea II, and that's what we have to stick with because that's what's canonical. So let me give the microphone back to you, and we will try to keep this more centered on Nicaea II. Fine. Uh, let me say first, that Nicaea II, the council we're talking about, was not really regarded as ecumenical until some years after the council ended. It was called to be an ecumenical council by the emperor, true, but with the consent of the pope. You had <clears throat> the patriarch of Constantinople at the time, Tarasios, wrote to Pope Adrian, your holiness has inherited the see of the divine apostle Peter, which wherefore lawfully and by the will of God, you preside over all the hierarchy of the church. Now that kind of language is an implicit admission of the authority that the Pope had over the entire church, precisely because of the privileges he had as the successor of Peter and being the chief over all the hierarchs of the church. Do we want to just stick with that point for now and maybe move to the next one? Yeah, I merely wanted to add that St. Right John, John of Damascus was one of the great saints of the church who protested against the constant interference of the emperors in the internal affairs of the church. You also have to remember that it was heretical emperors who also called so-called universal councils or ecumenical councils when they did not have the authority to do so. And the councils were in fact heretical and later repudiated by the Roman church. There must be a supreme authority in the church to be able to resolve dogmatic questions. The fact that the popes themselves affirmed their own authority in statement after statement after statement from Damasus to Nicholas, all the popes intervening, affirming their special authority that they had over the entire church, east and west. 
is simply a proof that they were expressing the common faith of the church. And that common faith of the church in the primacy of the, of the Petrine Sea of Peter was something that was also canonically affirmed by the canons of the church. But basically, the privileges of Peter stem from Christ himself, not just from canon laws that profess papal supremacy, as the Council of Sard Sardica did, when affirming the appellate jurisdiction of the Roman Church over all the other churches of God. So what we have here are, are constant affirmations of papal supremacy in the church of the first millennium that cannot be denied. And you have orthodox theologians like, like um, Oliviera, a French orthodox theologian, who frankly admitted that in the first millennium, the popes exercised a universal authority over the church. And why their testimony is not to be believed by modern Orthodox today baffles me. They're admitting what many Protestant scholars and Orthodox scholars have freely admitted, that in the church of the first millennium, the popes did exercise the universal authority. And this was admitted even by Byzantine theologians in the high Middle Ages who then tried to twist that supremacy for the Patriarch of Constantinople, who did, during the High Middle Ages, exercise the kind of universal authority over all the, all the Byzantine churches. And now they're confronted by the problem of open schisms between the Orthodox churches themselves, which have no resolution because there is no Orthodox church with authority that can decide the question. Who is Orthodox? Constantinople and Alexandria or Moscow, which are now in a formal schism. So where is Orthodoxy today? Who are the Orthodox? As some wag once said some, some time ago in the last century, there are as many Orthodoxies as there are Orthodox. And that is no solution to the problem. I would simply add this further point, which I think is important, namely that <clears throat> that uh, excuse me, a little trouble with my voice here. Sorry. The church historically during the first millennium was always called the Catholic Church not the Orthodox Church. In the first millennium, there was the Confession of Faith at the Council of Constantinople II. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. It doesn't say Orthodox Church. The term Catholic always has been exclusive to the church in communion with Rome. More attention should be paid also to the fact that the church as a visible church must have a center of unity. And there is no center of unity among the Orthodox simply because they have rejected the primacy of the Pope as successor of Peter, who serves as the center of unity for the entire church. If a church has no center of unity, you can never decide when schisms break out among the local churches who remain Orthodox who are the Orthodox in the split that occurs. And that is the great problem facing the Orthodox today. But Christ did provide the church with a supreme head. He did provide the church with a center of indefectible unity by which one can always determine where the church of Christ is when there is splits and divisions occurring among the local churches. Your turn. All right. Well, I, I thank you for your response. And I really appreciate all the issues bringing up. They are definitely important. And so it disappoints me that we're not going to have the time to get into them. And here's why. Because if we cannot assess the credibility of Roman Catholic claims about Nicaea II on their own merits without going to these other issues, how can we verify that each and every one of those other issues really do prove what you're saying? 
And so my opinion is if we could demonstrate that Nicaea II does not meet Roman Catholic presuppositions, then I think the rest of those other points likewise fall apart because I'd assert that those events that you're putting forward are misconstrued just like Nicaea II for reasons specific to the sources re relevant to them, which is why it would take more time than we have today. So we cannot cover them all and we got to focus on Nicaea II. And what I'm seeing here is that we're ignoring the fact that the Greek tones down the stuff that you say is so important. If the church accepted it, why would they do that? And so we're ignoring the fact that it's what we have as the Council of Nicaea II does not actually state what you assert because what was accepted by the church was the Greek. Another issue is, I think, in plain sight. Well, like, well, like, actually, you make too much of that difference between the Greek and Latin texts. All right. The Latin text, you do admit that the Latin text does promote the concept of papal supremacy by Hadrian. Actually, I don't. Right? I don't. You don't? I, I take it that you well, interpret okay. his words as such, and his words could be interpreted as such, but that those conversant in the Latin papal panegyric of, it, of the day would have not taken it literally, as evidenced by the fact of the Caroline books, which were in bitter, caustic opposition to Pope Adrian and Nicaea II, reiterated the same high, flowery praise for the Pope. So they were empty honorifics, while where the rubber met the road is when the Pope asked for jurisdiction in the Balkans, they rejected him and they cut that part right out of the letter. And it would be a strange thing for the Pope to ask for if the church just accepted he really was presiding over the whole church, he was supreme over the whole church, he had jurisdiction over the whole church. Why would he have to ask for jurisdiction for something and have it taken away from him if he actually had it the whole time? So the actions of the council and the Greek rendering of the council are utterly inconsistent with the very narrow, narrow literalistic interpretation of only the Latin minutes, which to reiterate, the Latin authority that translated those minutes into Latin. Anastasius the librarian said that the Greek was what was actually read at the council. So it's not my opinion. I'm reiterating what the Latin translator of Nicaea II actually asserted. Well, the letter that you had on the screen gives the words of Hadrian, right? It does. And if you look at those what, words what in the translation, it says, yes. as written by the Pope, right? And then if you go below to where it then gives the Greek rendering, it says, as read in Greek to the council. So the mainstream scholarly opinion is what's in the Latin is what the Pope wrote and what was accepted during the council after diplomatic exchange was what the Greek had. It makes no difference as to whether it was Latin or Greek. The fact is that the words you had on the screen were actually written by Adrian, were they not? They were, but I'm going to say this before um, you which is fine, interrogate me on this line of reasoning that you said it, it, it makes no difference because Adrian happened to say it. Um, but, I, the words, but the words he wrote were a full affirmation of papal supremacy has been taught by previous popes from Damasus all the way to Nicholas. They all but if you don't mind me interjecting, if you don't, if you don't so mind how, how me... Do you explain, how do you explain that the church would even give any kind of acknowledgement or recognition of papal supremacy, which Charlemagne certainly did, and the Caroline books also did. And the only reason they rejected the Council of Nicaea is because of a false misleading translation. Well, again, but to, to interject and to answer that question, the fact of the matter is, as I showed, Pope St. Galatius gave a, a subtly different criteria for the fact that Rome had primacy than what we see in this letter. In, Nice in the Latin rendering Nicaea too that the consent of the church gave the consent of the church gave Rome canonical authority that's right from Pope Saint Galatius not from Pope Adrian and so just because Adrian wrote it and it was obviously rejected because it was not read and affirmed in the council by virtue of him just stating it is really not sufficient because the council itself defines what makes a binding ecumenical council is not the ratification of the Pope but the cooperation of a Pope and the full assent of the rest of the patriarchates. 
And so this is not just my opinion. Roman Catholic scholars affirm that it was actually the full assent that was required in the East, not every jot and tittle ratified by the Pope in the West. I could read a footnote from Father Richard Price on that point if you want more detail. So I think there's a sort of tunnel vision going on here. If the Pope says it, it counts, right? We take it literal. But if the whole rest of the church says something else, it somehow doesn't count anymore. And I think that's really inconsistent. It's inconsistent with the Pope's actions that he couldn't do anything about jurisdiction being robbed from him. And to interpret Charlemagne, who uses, as you acknowledge, the same honorifics about the Pope, but not, didn't just reject the council because you didn't like how it was translated. They went point from point through Adrian's letter and said Adrian was wrong. How could he possibly do that if the Pope actually settled matters? It doesn't matter how it's translated. He said, well, if you settled things, I guess this is what it is. But clearly, that's not what he believed. Neither did later Carolingian kings who said the Pope is only correct when um, the Pope is acting in good faith. I could read the exact quote if you want. And also the synod at uh, Dozi, which said that the keys were given to all the bishops. And so the Carolingians were not um, submissive uh, to the most radical claims of the papacy, which I already stated they were made radical because they're looking for concessions. You don't look for concessions by aiming low, you aim high. And so I think you're reading something that was purposely exaggerated literally and ignoring what the rest of church really believed as stated and how they acted. So we have that demonstrated in history. So um, I'll give I you a time to respond, but I could get to other points if you want me to. I would simply reply that in the first millennium, you never had the whole church rejecting papal supremacy. You find contradictions where there are none. There's always been in an ecumenical council proceedings, a harmonization of views between the Pope and the rest of the bishops so that you have a judgment of the entire church. Now, the if, I, if Pope, you don't mind me interrupting right there, then I'll give it right back to you. That's just factually not true because you say, well, the criteria is we don't have an example of this, but we have this in Nicaea too, where they got the Latin and they didn't accept it. I really don't want to talk about other councils. We could talk about Council Two and the fact that they excommunicated the Pope, but that's for other debates. What we have in Nicaea Two is proof that that is absolutely not true. And so that would be my response to that. Well, I think you totally misconstrue the whole matter of the proceedings of, this, of, of Nicaea Two. But, but we, we did, have the Greek minutes Adrian, consistent with this. Adrian did express a full view of papal supremacy, did he not? I said he did not because other Latin thinkers didn't understand those words to mean as such. Well, you put them on a the screen, it's very clear to anyone who can read, namely that Pope Adrian said he was the chief of the church and with a authority derived from Christ himself which cannot be said of any other bishop in the church. Now, would, wouldn't you agree such a, that the meaning of words have a certain force that is different in different eras? And so if we want to understand how those words would have been meant at that time, we would look at contemporaries using these, those same words and see what they meant by them. And we have evidence of that in the Carolingian books, and we see what they did not mean by them is that the Pope is supreme, that he's infallible, that he's indefectible, because they rejected him on every point, point by point, nauseatingly in the Caroline books. I don't think you can do that. The, the Charlemagne and the Carolingians were fully respectful of papal authority. Then, why, then, by the fact, then why did they write the Caroline <laughs> books and reject his letter point by point in all his historical examples? It wasn't just... The Latria Dulia wasn't translated just clear enough. They went through the examples Pope Adrian used in that letter to the emperors, which is a fantastic letter, of course, and they rejected it point by point and gave varying interpretations. So they disagreed the interpretations of the whole points he was making, not just the usage of a couple words here or there. I don't see how you can read the letters that you put on the screen and come out with that misinterpretation. Anybody reading it realizes, and this is true of many of the scholars who have studied the papacy during this period from the, from the uh, fourth to the ninth centuries, 
they confess that the popes claim to be what they claim to be, what Pope Benedict the Sixteenth claimed to be, what John Paul the Second claimed to be. They all speak the same language, and you try to diminish it on every on every count you can. But I don't think it can be done truly and honestly. Well, and I and I appreciate the sincere difference of opinion, and I, I feel that you're authentic uh, with your point of view, and I just have to respectfully disagree. I think. In principle, you agree that who understands the the nuances of 8th century, late 8th century Latin better and what things mean, whether yourself or my, definitely not me, or Charlemagne, we're going to say, well, Charlemagne or his, or his court bishops that wrote the book in his name. And so that wouldn't be just the issue. The fact that the Latin wasn't accepted from the council kind of renders that whole point moot. So I don't mind humoring the issue and saying, well, the Latin probably even mean what we thought it meant to, to the Latins. And we have evidence of this, but it's sort of irrelevant because we have a council held in Greek where they didn't accept this letter and the Latins admitted the Greeks didn't accept it. So what you're saying that, well, where's the example of the church not accepting this? We have it right there. We have what they did in the Greek minutes showing that they did not. And what we also have in the Greek minutes and what we have that every single historian, and I'm sure you as yourself also agree, is that the Pope asked for jurisdiction in the Balkans, was not given jurisdiction in the Balkans. If the Pope could just settle things by fiat because he's the Pope, why ask for it? He would already have jurisdiction there. Why, why ask for the council to affirm his letter? His count, what he says would already go. And so it seems to me what occurred in this ecumenical council, what people said in the council, and what they actually did, because their actions speak louder than words, are radically inconsistent with the thesis you're given based upon just the Latin rendering of that letter. There's a difference between an administrative and jurisdictional canonical matter and the petrine primacy of supremacy in the church. The Pope had the latter, but the emperors continually interfered with his attempting to adjust the canonical provisions of the church. The two are two different things. Let me add here that no one was a stronger and uh, a, a promoter of papal supremacy than Anastasios, who translated so, those letters. I agree with you 100%. Remember? I agree with you 1,000%. Continue. <laughs> Well, you tell me, what is in that Greek letter that was read, which nullifies papal supremacy? That the, that the whole thrust of the letter in Greek had to do specifically, nope. had to do specifically with that Rome had its authority from both Saints Peter and Paul, not just Peter as the Latin says, and that it demonstrated that by all those who inherit the thrones of St. Peter and Paul, so that means all the bishops, do well when they affirm the faith of the apostles. And it, the proof text that Adrian gives is, here's the proof of this, read the life of St. Constantine, because when he met St. Peter and Paul, St. Peter and Paul, they had icons. And so that's the whole point of the passage. The Latin actually doesn't make sense, right? If you read the Latin, where's this proof text about St. Peter and Paul uh, appearing to Sylvester, uh, to Sylvester in the same paragraph? What's the relevance to that, to the claims just made two sentences beforehand? Well, there wouldn't be. So clearly the Greek actually offers to us the actual cogent point that Adrian was trying to make. And so I feel that the, the letter made in Latin, as proven by the fact that Tiresias asked the legates and, and witnesses to the legates to affirm that what was read was really what was in the letter, makes me believe that there was a letter made for Latin consumption and there was an actual letter sent to the council, which was then affirmed by the council as authentic and as what we have translated in the Greek. Now, this all gets into inferences and maybe we want to avoid those. And so my theory aside, here's the mainstream view. The Latin is authentic, the Greek's authentic, the Greek's what's read at the council, the Greek's what's accepted in the council, the Greek does not have the content that you need in order to prove papal supremacy. And so to me, that simply settles the issue. The reason for the Council of Nicaea being held was basically to confirm the fact that iconoclasm was heretical. All the popes before Hadrian had condemned iconoclasm as a real heresy. 
Hadrian came to the council with that same affirmation. And that was the purpose of holding the council. And in his statements to the council and to the emperor, Hadrian made very clear his profession of faith in papal supremacy and his, his universal authority over the entire church. Now, whether that letter was read as such in, in the council makes no difference. Hadrian's letters did profess papal supremacy in their full affirmation, and that suffices to know what was the belief of the Roman Church and the belief of the Church in general concerning papal supremacy. And the fact that the Roman See could not err in its profession of the faith, whereas Constantinople, under the Monophysite and Monothelite heresies, basically professed heresy and were shredding the deposit of faith. And Hadrian's interaction with the Council of Nicaea was simply to affirm that heresy and again to affirm papal supremacy over the entire church. Now, other scholars touching on the Council of Nicaea fully admit that papal supremacy was a factor in the relationship between the Roman Church and the Church of Constantinople. You go back to St. Gregory the Great, who openly said, and this is something that would resound across the ages, who doubts that Constantinople is subject to the See of Rome, to the Apostolic See? The emperor and the patriarch himself freely admitted it. Now there again is another example of the exercise of papal authority by a pope, and one of the greatest, Gregory the Great. And we have many of the saints in the East, Sophronius, for example, Stephen the Younger, Juvenal, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, and so many others whose testimonies could be given. So, in the first millennium, I would conclude by simply stating papal supremacy was a factor of life in the church of the first millennium, and the, the popes from Damasus onward to Nicholas simply affirmed the same faith that was affirmed by John Paul II and Benedict XVI, and yes, even by Francis. All right, and so do you want to make that your closing statement, or do you want me to respond and then make a closing statement? We could do maybe a few audience questions. Your, your call. Well, I would like to add one further point. Go right ahead. That, that the church knows her history better than any scholar. And what Vatican I affirmed and the Second Vatican Council affirmed represents the truth of what the first millennium believed. There is a hermeneutic of continuity among all the popes concerning the Petrine privileges that they enjoy. And that testimony is worth more than the fumblings of a particular scholar who tries to understand the history of the church better than the church herself does. That's it. Okay. And would you, would you want a closing statement after my response or should I make this like my closing statement? You can make a closing statement. Go okay. ahead. Okie dokie. Thank you, doctor. And so I think what we've seen here is that there's been a lot of outside examples to try to, illustrate this case that Nicaea II teaches papal supremacy. But the reason that's the case is because Nicaea II doesn't have the content to teach papal supremacy. As we've shown, the council did not accept the claims of the Pope. You know, the the Greek minutes are show demonstrate this. And let's let's break up some of the things that uh, we heard just spoken by my um, excellent intercluder tonight. He said, it makes no difference. It suffices to show what the belief that what Pope Adrian says suffices to show what the belief of the church is in general. How could that be the case when the church in general did not receive what he wrote? They, in fact, pr 
oppressed the legates to alter it according to Anastasius the librarian because it would have found it unacceptable. And that's from a big, big, big defender of the papacy, Anastasius the librarian. And so it doesn't suffice to show the belief of the church in general. What suffices to show that the belief of the church in general is what was actually accepted by the council. And what was actually accepted by the council? Matthew 16, 18 was quoted, and it was affirmed to be talking about the whole church, not just Rome. Um, the church was called, like I said, unshakable, immovable, you know, indefectible, infallible. And that was the whole church, not just Rome. So what the council is saying is that the whole church has these prerogatives, not just Rome. And that's what we see in the letter that we're disputing about tonight. We see that all those who inherit the thrones, plural, the thrones of Saints Peter and Paul, right, have these prerogatives. Um, and so we get into other examples. I can't get into all tonight, so I'm just going to kind of machine gun them real fast. And so people know there's more to talk about this, and God willing, maybe we could talk about this in more detail in the future. Um, but I just want to say, like we said, Rome cannot err, err, and you use the issue of monotheism. Well, Rome did err because the legates of Rome signed onto the Council of 636 in Cyprus, which accepted um, the, I don't want to get the, the thing wrong, but the monothelic statement from uh, Heraclius. So we have an example of Rome doing that. We have a Roman uh, bishop who signed on, who had in the first constitutum rejected what he later accepted in Constantinople II. So we have Roman popes erring. It's very obvious with many obvious examples of this. We saw other details that were wrong, I believe, in this presentation. Um, we heard that the, uh, the church of the first millennium never called itself the Orthodox Church. But in fact, the... Uh, Pope St. Uh, Gregory the Great in uh, Book 16, Letter 16 of his uh, Registrum Epistolarium calls the Roman Catholic Church, or just the Catholic Church rather, the Orthodox Church. And he does so very in writing the first paragraph. So yet the Orthodox Church of Christ have been founded by apostolic institution most firmly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if we're going to get details like this wrong, the question is, if we unpack all these other examples, what other details are wrong? And so ultimately, we could talk about Moscow. We could talk about visible authority. We could talk about all these things. But if we don't have Nicaea 2 right, what is the confidence of the audience to believe that we're going to have those other details and those other events correct as well? And so in closing, in closing, I'd say this. Nicaea 2 shows what the consensus of the church is, that the church is infallible, the church is indefectible, that the church needs the assent of all the patriarchs as well as the cooperation of the Roman emperor, the Roman emperor, the Roman pope, in order for a council to be binding. It's not that the emperor had a bunch of heretical councils. We don't know what a council is. Nicaea 2 gives us the definition, and we can have a conversation about this, but if you prove it out through history, it actually works, unlike papal ratification, which does not. And so I believe the fact that the Latin wasn't accepted by the council, that those who would have understood the Latin did not take those words to mean as we see the Roman Catholic side asserting, there's just no confidence that we could have in the idea that papal supremacy was taught in ICA2. If, if there is a 1% chance, 100% chance, we are to put 1% chance there is, the chance is literally 0% because the Greek minutes don't have it. Jurisdiction was not given to the Pope. And those who understood Latin statements, just like the one that we that uh, my intercalator read, intercalator read for us, did not understand those Latins the wor words to mean what he understood them to mean. So with that, I I close my argument. And um, if you have a few minutes, you want to take maybe three questions or you want to call it night, it's your call. Your time is extremely precious to me, and I'm grateful you joined us this evening. Let's have the questions. All right. So I'm going to go up a little bit because I'm not this tech expert. <laughs> so anyway, we have this question. And what do you say about the church father saying that the rock is the confession of Peter, some Christ, and few that say it's Peter also say that Peter represents all bishops? So how about you talk to us about, uh, how, in your understanding, how Matthew 16 and 18 has been exegeted by the fathers? Peter was given 
his special privileges because of his confession of faith. The church is not built on an abstract platonic confession of faith, but upon a real man, a real power, namely the person of Peter, who is the rock of the church. You have to have someone in the church with the final authority to decide dogmatic questions. It's not an abstract confession of faith where all bishops are equal and thus consequently none of them are able to resolve any question because when all are equal, none have authority. None have final authority to settle anything. So there's no contradiction between the church being built on the confession of faith and Peter himself as the person holding the primacy of Peter in his position as the chief apostle of the church. All right. I've got a, a question from Hieromonk, uh, Hieromonk Zosmus Krampus. And so we have a fellow Greek here. He says, what's the point of even discussing Nicaea II or any of the first millennium councils if Vatican I and Vatican II are the final authority? So that's his question. What was the last part there? He said, what's the point of discussing Nicaea II if Vatican I and Vatican II are the final authority? So that's his question. Well, any ecumenical council can be rendered as the final authority. That's the purpose of having a a council, a universal ecumenical council, where the whole body of the church is represented, both in its head and its members. All right. Now, we got this question from Sebastian Rock, which, by the way, reminds me, you probably aren't into the band Skid Row. They're even before, before my time a little bit, but Sebastian Brock was the name of their singer. But anyway, Sebastian Rock says, what does St. Gregory mean when he said, Whoever calls himself desires to be called universal priest and his elation, the precursor of the Antichrist, book seven, letter 33. And so how do you understand this critique from St. Greg the Great of that uh, term universal priest? Yes. The word ecumenical was translated into Latin as universal. And Gregory the Great took that as meaning the Patriarch of Constantinople, the Ecumenical Patriarch, was the only Patriarch in the Church. He was the only Bishop. He was the Universal Bishop, the only Bishop. And that is what Gregory the Great protested against. Because if the Patriarch of Constantinople was the only Bishop, what about all the rest of them that had been consecrated to the Episcopate, including the Roman Pontiff himself? So that was why he rejected the term, because he misunderstood what was meant. What was really meant by the Patriarch of Constantinople was that he was the imperial patriarch, not the only patriarch. But Gregory the Great thought he meant that exactly, the only patriarch, which now, was absurd. If you don't mind me asking you, I always found the, the title for the Bishop Alexandria, Judge of the Universe, to be a... They'd be a peculiar title. So is that a similar title, maybe like uh, like hearkening back to St. Carol of Alexandria, where he acted like a judge during Council of Ephesus? Well, what's the deal with that title? Well, he may have given himself that pretentious uh, title, judge of the world or judge of the universe, but he never acted on it. He never exercised such a power. He didn't pretend to. But the Roman pontiffs did exercise that power continually throughout the first millennium. All right, so we got a question right on that, so hopefully that's in your wheelhouse. Um, it's asking you to provide, I'm quoting, uh, an example or instance of a pope exercising authority over the church as a collective body or council. We may grant authority over individual hierarchs. So I guess he's saying, do we have an example of a pope over overruling an, an ecumenical council? No. He did overrule false ecumenical councils held by heretics. And I and the I would yeah. the council, for example, the Council of Hier Hiera. Uh, Hiera. Yeah. It was an iconoclast council which was condemned by the Pope. And we have Ephesus too as well, obviously. Um, but we also have to the contrary, like Constantinople too, you know, as an example of uh 
of a pope uh, not affirming a uh, council and you know and the council really not caring and we have the same issue with Consulpa one somewhat because it's through St. Ambrose was the one speaking on behalf of the Western bishops. We don't really have the Pope at that time actually explicitly rejecting the council, but that, that's a whole other issue. And I'd love to talk about that with you someday, but um, here's here among Zosimus again. I'll give him two questions because he's clergy. Why was there a debate about the Tomolio if it was universally understood that the Pope is the infallible authority? So, like, why did they assess the tome? I think it was session four of Chalcedon. If the Pope was infallible and they all understood that, and whatever he said goes. Well, bishops at an ecumenical council are also judges of the faith, are judges of the faith, and therefore, when a dogmatic matter is brought before them, they're going to see for themselves whether it conforms to scripture and tradition. But despite all that. It was quite clear that Pope Leo would not permit his dogmatic definition of the faith to be questioned at all. They could examine it, they could look at it, they can discuss all matters of things about it, but they could not reject it. And Pope Leo would not stand for that because it was a dogmatic definition delivered ex cathedra. All right, we've got uh, you. We might not. We might be running out of time because um, I'm sure it's getting late uh, for both of us, and so I might skip a few questions. So this one's for me, but I want to give you an opportunity because we didn't really get to talk about this night. And the question for me is, who is the head of the body, right, for the Orthodox Church? And I would say this: I'd say both Roman Catholics and Orthodox concur that it's Christ, right? The Pope is the vicar of Christ, right? He's vicariously Christ the church, but that doesn't undo that Christ the head of the church of Roman Catholics. Would, would you agree with that? Of course. Of course, right? And so the question would be, well, do the Orthodox have any sort of vicarious Christ, right? The, the, the Roman Catholics do. It's the Pope. And I would say, of course we do. It's the bishop. That's what St. Ignatius says. And so if we're going, well... But there's a lot of bishops. Is there one above all the others? The answer will be yes, we do have canonical order among the bishops. He would be our visible head. What visible head doesn't entail, in my opinion, and this is where obviously um, you would disagree with me, my good sir, would be the fact that, uh, that that means the visible head doesn't have the supreme authority, right? I would see the head and the, the body with mutual consensus, like we see in Acts chapter 15, Apostolic Canon 34, like we see in the Holy Trinity, the Son submitting to the Father. Um, and so what we see is, I feel, something that is, I've called elsewhere, pre, uh, ecclesiastical predestinarianism is a heresy when we just think the Pope settles something and, and no one freely consents to it. There has to be a head and free consent to the head. That's what exists in marriage, slave and master, um, children and parents. Um, this is these are sacra It's a sacramental reality that's not a coincidence, right? That's why Saint Paul, when he talks about head coverings in First Corinthians eleven, talks about this issue and he talks about submission and consent. Without that, it just doesn't work. And so I feel we do have a head in orthodoxy. Um, it would be the ecumenical patriarch. And if he, being that he's, in my opinion, and you're going to disagree with me, in schism, it would go to the next person who is in that canonical order. And for example, if the papacy re-enters Orthodox communion, it'd go right back to the Pope. In fact, he has a charism by God. And that's why the Orthodox Church has never replaced the Bishop of Rome. You cannot replace the Bishop of Rome. All right. And so that'd be my response to that. It could be a whole video on its own, but I'm sure you want to add a little bit of your own thoughts in there. So let me give you the last word on that. Do you know of any visible body in this world that does not have a visible head? You also have to remember St. Paul saying Christ must have the primacy in all things. But what about Christ's primacy in the church? How is it visibly manifested and recognized? It is visibly manifested in the person of the successor of Peter, to whom Christ made to be the rock of the church, the bearer of the keys of the kingdom, the confirmer of his brethren, and chief pastor of all the lambs and sheep of Christ. So the church does have a visible head, and by possessing a visible head, 
He possesses at the same time the supreme authority in the church, which the church must have to be a relevant entity in the modern world. All right, now, I, I, got, I got a question that, I, I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? My apologies. No, I just finished. Okay. And so I think this is a good one for you because I think you have a very good answer to this and we'll surprisingly agree on this. You're going to see. So here's the question. Pope St. Gregory the Great said, the chair of Peter is Rome, Antioch, and Alexandria. What makes Peter's successors in only Rome have supreme authority and be infallible? So what would your answer to that be? Well, the three C's of Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch were established by the Council of Nicaea. And what was going to happen in the future was namely the aggressive stance of Constantinople to outdistance both Antioch and Alexandria and to have complete control of the seas in the Byzantine Empire. So it was Constantinople that was always an upstart and pretender to a usurpation of authority that was climaxed in the high Middle Ages when they did exercise a kind of papism over the entire Byzantine church, and which is being disputed now among both Greek and Russian theologians today. So it was a honorary precedence of Antioch and Alexandria together with Rome, but Rome was the indefectible see. It could not err in the faith, whereas the other two had already succumbed to heresies, the Nestorian heresy and the Monophysite heresy. All right, and I would I want to add something that's going to prove your argument. It's the relics of Peter are not in Alexandria. The relics of Peter are not in Antioch. Those relics are in Rome. Right, the spiritual succession to Peter, the, the even though Peter is the bishop to all the apostles, so in a sense everyone's a patron bishop, but that's irrelevant to this question. The point is Peter's relics are in Rome. There's a hagiography that the reason why Cyprus was given autonomy, right, and we read about this in Chalcedon, was because they found Saint Barnabas's relics, right? It showed that they had apostolic origin and justification for having autonomy. And so the relics of the apostle um, is something incredibly important for passing forward a charism um, to the successor bishop to that uh, individual. And so I believe that Rome does have a special charism because the relics are there. And it's not just Peter. It's also Paul. Um, and so I think simply saying there's other patron bishops um, does not remove the force of the fact that the relics are in Rome. I've been to the Vatican and I saw the relics, so they are there. So, um, you know, I presume you agree with me about that. And um, let's see. Yes, the relics, were, the relics of Peter in Rome were, was one factor in establishing his primacy. But uh, Alexandria was the see that was established by Mark, the disciple of Peter. And Antioch was the see where Peter himself was the bishop for a number of years. So that was the reason for Alexandria and Antioch having the major jurisdictions in the church as fixed by the Council of Nicaea. And their precedence as second and third sees in the church was constantly being disrupted by Constantinople's aggressiveness in trying to be the second see in the church thereby displanting both Alexandria and Antioch. And that has been one of the reasons for eventually the Greek schism. All right, we got, I, I'm only going to bother you for two more questions. You've been more than generous. I don't think anyone else could have at least argued your point better than you, and I'm grateful for that. And so um, before we give you an opportunity to maybe give your plugs, I have some links in the description for people to follow up on your website and your books. Um, I have one of these last questions, which is, how do we know that our, inter our interpretation of what a pope declares is correct? So I think his question is this. Let's just concede the pope is infallible. He makes infallible ex cathedra statements. The scripture is also infallible, right? What what good is that if the people that must interpret these things are fallible? So what would your response to that be? 
Well, you have to have a final interpreter of the meaning of scripture too, don't you? All the reason, therefore, to have a supreme authority in the church in the form of the, of the Roman pontiff who can make final decisions concerning the meaning of scriptural texts. And that, of course, was done to a great extent at the Council of Florence, where papal supremacy and conciliar harmonization worked together to determine the meaning of scriptural texts concerning justification, for example. So a supreme authority in the church is in the form of an ecumenical council acting in harmony with the Roman pontiff who has his own uh, special privileges in the church as the final authority in matters of doctrine. All right, and we have one final question. I think it's a good one because it brings us full circle on Nicaea 2, and it's this. Do not the saints of that time clearly say that a council needs the ratification of the entire pentarchy, right, like we saw in session 6 of Nicaea 2? If so, this is an absolute contradiction of modern papal physiology. Would you agree or disagree with that statement from Michael that pentarchic ratification undoes Vatican I um, the Vatican I view of the papacy? You have never had an ecumenical council with complete uh, sanction by the rest of the church, by the whole church. There never has been such a, uh, such a uh, thing. After every ecumenical council, you've had large numbers of bishops breaking away into systems and heresies. Each of the ecumenical councils, in a sense, made things worse because of the departure of many bishops from Catholic unity. The only reason, fundamental reason, why councils are ecumenical is because they received the ratification and sanction of the supreme visible head of the church, namely the Roman Pontiff. You may dispute that all you want, but there is no other sensible, rational reason why a council should be regarded as ecumenical. It has never received the consent of the entire church, it must receive the consent of the visible head of the church. And this is what has happened. All right. And, and every, ecumenical, every ecumenical council has been sanctioned by the Roman pontiff, including Nicaea II, which was held to be an ecumenical council, but it was not regarded as such until the Pope ratified it as ecumenical. And that took some years. Thank you. All right. Well, in, in my response to that would be, you said there never has been such a thing as a council that's been received by the whole church. But I mean, I know there's scholars that would agree with you, but the issue is Nicaea 2 doesn't. Nicaea 2 explicitly contradicts it. So if I'm going to accept the scholars or what the church teaches, I'm going to accept what the church teaches. And so that might be fetistic. And if we want to ever take that time and flesh out the historical case for this, we should definitely do so. And it would be my honor to do that with you. Um, but, you know, Pope Adrian, he cooperated this council right off the bat. He accepted this council right off the bat. He sent a translation to Charlemagne right off the bat. There was never any doubt that Rome ratified this council. A, a lot of the question over uh, the acceptance of this council was really whether the the uh, legate to Antioch and Jerusalem was legitimate. And actually those patriarchates were the ones which it kind of went back and forth, but by Council of Constantinople 4879 880, that was totally scotched over and they affirmed that the whole Pentarchy really did uh, accept this. And that's not an issue for Orthodox because Orthodox believe in the doctrine, uh, doctrine of receptionism for councils. Um, but being that's the case, there's so much more we could talk about. We've already been talking for an hour and a half. So, Dr. Lakatis, I have the link to your website here. Is there anything else you would like to let the audience know to follow up more on this issue or on your work? Well, it was, it's very difficult to find my books. It's possible that you can still trace one on BookFinder or Amazon, but they are rare until they are, they are to be reprinted, hopefully within the next few months. But oh, if so anyone wants to contact me, they're welcome to do so by writing jameslacudis1 at gmail.com. 
I want to thank you, Craig, for a very interesting discussion. You are very formidable. Well, uh, you're very welcome. It's a pleasure to, to speak with you. And uh, to be honest, you said I really appreciate your debate with Ubi Patris. I view that you came out very strong in that debate, and you're a very thoughtful um, debater. And so I do appreciate uh, this time with you. And it was well worth all the technical issues beforehand. I'll give my plug for the audience. If you happen to be Orthodox and this show has blessed you, please bless someone else and donate to the Orthodox churches in Cambodia. You could do so by going to orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. It's scrolling on the bottom. It's also linked in the bottom. And you don't have to send the money to the PayPal. There's money wiring instructions to the Moscow Patriarch. Uh, patriarchate churches in Cambodia, or you could send via PayPal if that's how you want to do it. But even if you don't have money or you only have a couple bucks to send, it, it doesn't matter. Donate to someone else, give alms, pray for us. Um, if this has blessed you, bless someone else and God will bless you. And I'd just say I'd appreciate that because whether it be prayer, financial, or whatever, it shows that you appreciate the work both of us put into this presentation. And so um, stay on the air. I'll just say goodbye to you when uh, after I turn this thing off. But I will end the show live as I end all of them by quoting Jesus at Sirach. Fight to death for the truth, and the Lord God will fight for you. God bless you all. Have a good night.